From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello everybody, welcome to the Cube's exclusive coverage of IBM Think's 2020 digital event experience, the Cube covering wall to wall. We've got a number of interviews planned for you going deep. My name is Dave Vellante, I'm here with Stu Miniman. Stu, how you doing? Doing great, Dave. So we're socially distant, <laughs> as you can see, uh, in the studio in Marlboro, everybody's you know, six feet apart. We've got our masks on, we took them off for this, uh, for this segment. So Stu, um, let's get into it. So, a very interesting time, obviously, for IBM. Um, Arvind Krishna doing the, the big keynote, Jim Whitehurst, new president. So you got new leadership. Um, a lot of talk about resilience, um, agility and flexibility, you know, which is kind of interesting. Obviously, a lot of their clients are thinking about uh, COVID-19 in that context. IBM is trying to provide solutions and capabilities. We're going to get into it, but really the linchpin of all this is OpenShift and Red Hat. And um, we're going to talk about what that means for the vision that Arvind Krishna laid out. Uh, and let's get into it. Your, your thoughts on Think 2020. Yeah, so Dave, of course, you know, last week we had Red Hat Summit. So right. Red Hat is still Red Hat. You and I had a nice discussion uh, going into Red Hat Summit. Yes, $34 billion acquisition. They're now under IBM. Jim Whitehurst slides over in that new role as president. Um, but you know, one of the questions we've had fundamentally, Dave, is does an acquisition like this, will it change IBM? Will it change the cloud landscape? Uh, OpenShift and Red Hat are doing quite well. Uh, we definitely have seen some, some of the financials. Uh, and every audience that hasn't seen your uh, analysis segment of IBM should really go in and see that because it, Red Hat, of course, is one of the bright spots uh, in the financials there. Uh, you know, good growth rate on the number of customers and what they're doing in cloud. and underneath a lot of those announcements you dig down and oh yeah, there's OpenShift uh, and there's uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, RHEL. So, you know, a long partner for decades between IBM and Red Hat, but is, you know, how will the IBM scale really help uh, the Red Hat uh, pieces? There's a number of announcements underneath, you know, not just, you know, how does the entire world work on, you know, Z and Power and all of the IBM platforms, but, uh, you know, I believe it's Arvind says one of the enduring platforms needs to be the hybrid cloud and you heard at Red Hat Summit the entire week, it was the open hybrid cloud uh, was the discussion. Well, yeah, so the, actually it was interesting, you brought up Arvind's sort of pillars. There were three enduring platforms that he cited and then the fourth of course is, is I guess open hybrid cloud, but the first was mainframes, the second was, and I'm not sure if this is the right order, the second was services and then the third was middleware. Um, so, Basically he's saying, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to win the day for the architecture of, of hybrid cloud. What's that mean to you? Then I'd like to chime in. Yeah, so, so, so Dave, first of all, you know, when, when we did our analysis, when IBM bought Red Hat and says, you know, my TLDR was, does this change the cloud landscape? My answer was, no. If I'm Amazon, I'm not sitting there saying, oh geez, you know, the combination of IBM and Red Hat, well, they're partners and they're, they're going to be involved in it. Uh, does IBM have huge opportunities in hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, and edge computing? Absolutely. Uh, one of the questions is, you know, how will IBM services really be transformed? Uh, you know, Dave, we've watched over the last decade, some of the big service organizations have really shrunk down. Cloud changed the marginal economics. You've done so much uh, discussion of this over the last handful of years uh, that you need to measure yourself against the hyperscalers. You need to, uh, you know, see where you can add value. And the, the question is, Dave, you know, when and where do we think of IBM? in the new era. Well, so <clears throat> coming back to sort of your point about Red Hat and, and services, is it about cloud, is it about services? Near term, I've said, it's, it's more about services than it is about cloud. Longer term, I think it is about cloud, but, but IBM's definition of cloud is maybe a little different than, than ours. Um, but when Ginny uh, went on the road show to, of, after the Red Hat acquisition, she said, well, this is going to be accretive to free cash flow within one year. And the reason why I always believe that is because they were going to plug Red Hat, and we've talked about this, and OpenShift, right into their services business and start modernizing applications right away. They've actually achieved that. So I think they had pretty good visibility. Um, and that was kind of a mandate. So IBM's huge services organization is in a good position to do that. They've got deep industry expertise. We heard Arvind Krishna on his keynote talking about that. Um, Jim Whitehurst 
talking more about services. You really didn't hear Jim, you know, previously in his previous roles, talk a lot about services uh, other than as part of the ecosystem. So it's an interesting balancing act that, that IBM has to do. The real thing I want to dig into, Stu, is winning the day with the, with, with the architecture of hybrid cloud. So let's start with, with cloud. Let's talk about how IBM uh, defines cloud. Uh, IBM on its earning, earnings call, we talked about this on our, our Red Hat Summit analysis, uh, the cloud was you know, 23 billion, you know, growing at whatever, 20, 20 plus percent. When, <laughs> my eyes have been bleeding reading IBM financial statements and 10Ks for the last couple of weeks. But when you go in there and you look at what's in that cloud, and I shared this on my breaking analysis uh, this week, a very small portion of that cloud revenue, that what, last year, 21 billion, very small portion is actually what they call cloud, cloud and cognitive software. It's only about 20% of the pie. It's really services. It's about two thirds services. So that is a bit of a concern, but at the same time, it's their greatest opportunity because they have such depth in services. If IBM can increase the percentage of its business that's coming from higher margin software business, which was really the strategy go back 20 years ago, uh, it's just the services be became this so big and so pervasive uh, that that software percentage, you know, maybe it grew, maybe it didn't, but but that's IBM's opportunity is to really drive that 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 software-based revenue. So let's talk about what that looks like. How does OpenShift play in that IBM definition of cloud, which includes on-prem, the IBM public cloud, everybody else's public cloud, multi-cloud, and the edge? Yeah. Well. First of all, Dave, right, the, the, the question is, where does IBM technologies, where do they live? Uh, so, you know, look even before the Red Hat piece, if we looked at IBM systems, there's a number of times that you're seeing IBM software living on various public clouds. And that's goodness, you know, one of the things we've talked about for a number of years is, you know, how can you become more of a software company? How can you move to more of the, you know, cloud consumption models? You're going more OpEx and CapEx. So IBM had done some of that and Red Hat should be able to help supercharge that. When we look at some of the announcements, uh, the one that of course caught my eye the most, Dave, uh, is the you know, IBM Cloud Satellite. Uh, would, would say the shorthand of it, it's IBM's version of Outposts. Mm -hmm. um, and underneath that, what is it? Oh, it's OpenShift underneath there. And you know, how can I take those pieces? And we know OpenShift can live across you know, almost any of the clouds. And you know, can it live on the IBM cloud? Absolutely. Can it be OpenShift be in the data center and on virtualization, uh, whether it be open source or VMware? Absolutely. So satellite being a fundamental con component underneath of OpenShift makes a lot of sense. And of course Linux. Yeah, right. Linux underneath. If you look at the, the one that we've heard IBM talking about for a while now is cloud packs, is really how are they helping customers to simplify and build that cloud native stack? You start with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you put OpenShift on top of that, and then cloud packs are that simple tool set for whether you're doing data or AI or integration, that middleware that you talked about in the past. Uh, IBM has way that, ways that they've done middleware for decades, and now they have the wonderful open source to help enable that. Yeah, so. I mean, WebSphere, Bluemix, IBM Cloud now, but, but OpenShift is really that, that PaaS layer that, yeah. that IBM coveted. Right, know. and I, I was talking to some of IBM's partners getting ready for this event, and they say if you dig through the 10K, CloudPacks is one of those that, you know, there are thousands of customers that are using this, so it's good traction, not just, hey, we have this cloud stuff, and it's wonderful, and we took all of these acquisitions every everything from soft layer to software pieces, but you know, cloud packs is you know, a nice starter uh, for companies to, to help really move forward on some of their cloud native application journey. Yeah, so what, what we talked about this past week in the breaking analysis, and certainly David Floyer has been on this as well, is this notion of being able to run um, a Red Hat based, uh, let's call it a stack, uh, everywhere. And Jim Whitehurst has talked about that, uh, essentially, Really, whether it's on-prem, at the edge, in the clouds, but the key there, Stu, is being able to do so natively. So every layer of, you know, the, of again, call it the stack, IT services, the data plane, the control plane, the management plane, all the planes, uh, being able to, the, you know, networking, the transport, et cetera. Being natively able to run wherever it is so that you can take fine grain uh, uh, advantage and leverage the primitives on respective clouds. The, the advantage that IBM has, in my view, love your thoughts on this, is that Red Hat based platforms, it's open source. 
And so, I mean, is somebody going to trust Amazon to be the the cloud native, anybody's cloud, uh, you know, solution? Well, if you're part of the Amazon stack, I mean, Amazon, frankly, and, and Oracle have a similar kind of mindset, you know, red stack, Amazon stack, make it all homogeneous and it'll run just fine. IBM's coming at it from an open source perspective. So they, they in some ways, will have more credibility, but it's going to take a lot of investment to really shepherd those standards. They're going to have to put a lot of commitments in, um, committers, uh, and they're going to have to incent people to actually adhere to those standards. Yeah, I, I mean, Dave, it's the, the idea of PaaS, the platform as a service that we've been chasing as an industry for more than a decade. Um, What's interesting, if you listen to IBM, what's underneath this? Well, it's you know taking advantage of the container-based architecture with Kubernetes underneath. So, can I run Kubernetes anywhere? Yeah, pretty much. Every cloud has their own service. OpenShift can live everywhere. The question is, what David Floyer is rightly putting out, okay, if I bake to a single type of solution, can I really take advantage of the native offerings? So the discussion we've always had for a long time is do I virtualize something, in which case I'm really abstracting away, I get to, you know, I can't take advantage of the, the, all the various pieces, D do I do multi-cloud, in which case I have some least common denominator um, way of looking at cloud because I, what I want to be able to do is get the value and differentiation out of each cloud I use but not be stuck on any cloud. And yes, Dave, Red Hat with OpenShift and space with Kubernetes and the open source community um, is definitely a leading way to do that. What you worry about is saying, okay, how much is this stuck on containerization? Will it be able to take advantage of things like serverless? You, you talk to IBM and say, okay, underneath it's going to have all of this wonderful components. Dave, when I talk to Andy Jassy and he says, if I was rebuilding AWS today, it would all be serverless underneath. So what is that underlying construct? You know, is it flexible and can it be updated? Uh, Red Hat and IBM are going to bridge between the container world and the serverless world with things like Knative. Um, but absolutely, we are not yet at the nirvana that developers can just build their apps and know that it can run anywhere and take advantage of anything. So, you know, some things we know we need to keep working on. So a couple other things there. So Jim Whitehurst talked about um, ingesting innovation, that the nature of innovation is such that it comes from a lot of different places. Open source obviously is a you know, fundamental you know, component of that. He talked about the telco edge. Um, he gave an example of Vodafone. Arvind Krishna talked about uh, Anthem kind of redefining healthcare post COVID. So you're seeing some examples, of course it's good that IBM puts forth some really you know, proof points. It's not just you know, slideware, which is good. I think the, the interesting thing, you, know, you can't just put you know, containers out there and expect the innovation to find its way into those containers. It's going to take a lot of work to make sure that as those different layers of the stack that we were talking about before are, are actually going to come to fruition uh, so there's, there's, the, there's some other announcements in this regard. So there's Edge, commu edge Computing uh, Application Manager, let's say the Telco Edge, a lot of automation focused. Uh, you mentioned IBM Satellite. There's the Financial Services Cloud. So we're seeing IBM actually you know, sp sprinkle around some investments there. Uh, as I said in my breaking analysis, I'd like to see them dial up those investments a little bit more, maybe dial down the return of cash at least for the next several years to shareholders. Yeah, I mean, Dave, the, the, the concern, you, you would talk to most customers and you say, well, if you try to even optimize your own data center and turn it into a cloud, how can you take advantage of the innovation that the Amazon, Microsoft, Googles, and IBMs are, ta are, are putting out there in the world? You want to be able to plug into that. You want to be able to leverage the, those new services. So that is where, it's definitely a shift, Dave. You think about IBM over 100 years, usually they're talking about their patent portfolio. Um, I, I think they've actually opened up a lot of their patent portfolio to help attack uh, you know, the COVID-19. So it is definitely a very different message and tenor that I hear under Arvind Krishna, you know, in very early days than what I was used to for the last decade or two uh, from IBM. Yeah, well at the risk of being a little bit uh, repetitive, one of the things that I talked about in my breaking analysis is I highlighted that Arvind said he wants to lead with a technical story, which I really like. Arvind's a technical visionary. Uh, his predecessors, his three predecessors, were not considered technical visionaries. 
And so I think that's one of the things that's been lacking uh, inside of IBM. I think it's one of the reasons why, why services has been such a dominant component. So, I, I, look, Lou Gerstner, it's hard to argue with the performance of the company, but when he made the decision and IBM made the decision to go all in on services, it, it, something's got to give, and what gave, and I've said this many, many times in theCUBE, was, was product leadership. So I'd like to see IBM get back to that product leadership, and I think Red Hat gives them an opportunity to do that. Obviously Red Hat and Linux, uh, you know, open source, it is a leader, the leader. And this is jump ball, as we've talked about many times, in this multi-hybrid, cloud, edge, you know, throw in all the buzzwords, but there's some interesting horses on the track. You got, you got VMware, uh, we throw in AWS just because they're there. You can't talk about cloud without talking about AWS. Certainly Microsoft has designs there, Cisco, uh, Google, everybody wants a piece of that pie. And I would say that you know, Red Hat with, with, with OpenShift is in a good position if in fact they can make the investments necessary to build out those stacks. Yeah, it, it, it's funny Dave because IBM for the history, the size that they are, often can get overlooked. You talk about, you know, we've probably spent more airtime talking about the VMware Amazon relationship than almost any in the last few years. Well, we forget we were sitting at VMworld and two months before VMware announced the Amazon partnership, who was it that was up on the main stage with Pat Gelsinger? It was IBM, because IBM was the first partner. Uh, I, I believe I saw numbers that IBM was saying that they have more hosted VMware environments than anyone out there. I'd, I'd love to see the data on it to understand there, because you know IBM plays in so many different places. They just often are not you know aggregated and counted together. Uh, you, you know when you get outside of some of the you know middleware mainframe, some of the pieces that you talked about earlier, Dave. So IBM does have a strong position, they just haven't been the front center leader uh, too often, but they have a broad portfolio and very much services led. Uh, so they, they kind of get uh, forgotten you know, off on the sides. So IBM's st stated strategy is to bring those mission critical workloads into the cloud. Uh, they've said that 80% of the workloads remain on-prem, only 20% have been, been cloudified. You know, when you when you peel the onions on that, there's just there's so much growth in cloud native workloads. So, you know, there's there is a somewhat of a so what in in that. But I will say this: so where are the mission critical workloads? Where do they live today? They live on prem. We can agree on that. But 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 whose stacks are running those? It's IBM and it's Oracle. And and David Floyer has done some research that suggests that if you're going to put stuff into the cloud that's mission critical, you're probably better off staying with those those stacks that are, that are going to allow you to a lower risk move, not have to necessarily rip and replace. And so, you know, migrating a mission critical Oracle database into AWS or a DB2 you know, you know, uh, infrastructure into AWS is, is going to be much more challenging than, than going same, same into the IBM cloud or the respective Oracle cloud. So I guess my question to you, Stu, is, why do people want to move those mission critical workloads into the cloud, do they? Well, first of all, it's unlocking innovation that you talked about, Dave. So, uh, you know, we, we looked at from a VMware standpoint versus a Red Hat standpoint, if you talk about building new apps, doing containerization, having that cloud native mindset, do I have a bimodal configuration, not, not a word that we talk about as much anymore because I want to be able to modernize it. Modernizing those applications, doing any of those migrations, we know are super challenging. It, you know, heck, David Floyer has talked about it for a long, long time. So you, you bring up some great points here that, you know, Microsoft might be the best at meeting customers where they are and giving people a lot of options. IBM lines up in many ways in similar ways. Um, my biggest critique about VMware is they don't have tight ties to the application. Uh, it's mostly, you know, virtualize it or now we have some cloud native pieces, but uh, other than the Pivotal group, they didn't do a lot with modernization on applications. Uh, IBM with their middleware history, Red Hat with everything that they do in, with the developer communities are well positioned to help customers along those digital journeys and going through those transformations. So it's, you know, applications need to be updated. You know, if anybody that's used applications that are long in the tooth know that they don't have the features that I want, they don't react the way they want, 
Heck, today, Dave, everybody needs to be able to access things where they are on the go. You know, it's not a discussion anymore more about you know virtual desktop. Uh, it's about you know work anywhere, have access to the data where I need it, uh, and be much more flexible and agile. And those are some of the configurations that you know IBM has history and their services arm can help customers move along those journeys. Yeah, so you know, I think one of the big challenges IBM has is it's got a, it's got its, fing, its fingers in a lot of pies. Um, AI, you know, they talk a lot about blockchain, talk about quantum. Quantum's not going to be here for a while. It's very cool. Uh, we have an interview coming up with uh, with Jamie Thomas, and you know, she's all over the quantum. We've talked to her in the past about it. Um, but I think you know, if you think about IBM's business in terms of services and product, you know, it's whatever it is, a seventy-five you know billion dollar organization. Uh, two thirds, or and maybe not quite two thirds, maybe 60 plus percent is services. Services are not an R&D intensive business. You look at a company like Accenture, Stu, I think Accenture spent last year 800 million on R&D. They're a $45 billion, $46 billion company. So if you really isolate the IBM you know, company to, to products, whatever, call it 25, 30 billion, they spend a large portion of that that revenue on R&D to get to the six billion. But my argument is it's, it's not enough to really drive the type of innovation that they need. Uh, just another, again, Accenture data point, because they're kind of a, a gold standard along with IBM, EY, and others, in, uh, and a couple of others in, in services. They return 76% of their cash to shareholders. IBM has returned consistently 50 to 60% to its shareholders. So, Arvin stated he wants to return IBM to growth. You know, every, every IBM CEO says that. Ginny, I used to talk about, has to shrink to grow. As I said, unfortunately, she, she ran out of time, and now it's up to Arvin to show that. But to me, growth has got to come from fueling R&D, whether it's organic or inorganic. I'd like to see you know, organic as the real driver for obvious reasons. And I don't think just open source in and of itself obviously is going to attract that, it'll attract innovation, but whether or not IBM will be able to harness it to its advantage is the real challenge, unless they're making huge, huge commitments to that open source. And in a microcosm, you know, as a kind of a proxy, we saw what happened to Hortonworks and, and Cloudera because they had to, had to fund that open source commitment. You know, IBM, we're talking about much, much with the hybrid multi-cloud edge a much, much bigger uh, opportunity, but, but requirement, and we haven't even talked about AI. You know, bringing, you know, I, think, I think you have a quote on, you know, data is the fuel, what was that quote? Yeah, so it was Jim Whitehurst, he said, data is the fuel, cloud is the platform, AI is the accelerant, and then security, I, I, my, my paraphrase is the mission control uh, there. So, uh, sounds a lot like your uh, innovation cocktail that you've been talking about uh, for the last year or so, Dave, but. Uh, yeah, data, it, AI, cloud. Um, but so, okay, but AI is the accelerant, and I agree, by the way. Applying AI to all this data that we have you know, over the years, automating it uh, and, and scaling it in the cloud is critical. And if, if IBM wants to define cloud um, as you know, the cloud experience anywhere, I, I'm fine with that. I'm not a fan of the way they break down their cloud business. I think it's bogus, and I've, I've called them on that, but okay, fine. Um, so maybe we'll get by that, I'll get over it. Uh, but, but, but really, that is the opportunity. It's just, it's got to be funded. Yeah, no, Dave, absolutely. Uh, yeah, IBM has a lot of really good assets there. They've got strong leadership, as you've said. Can Arvin do another Satya Nadella uh, transformation? There, there's the culture, there's the people, uh, and there's the product. So, you know, IBM, you know, absolutely has a lot of great resources and you know, smart people and some really good products out there, as well as some really good ecosystem partnerships. Um, it's, it, you know, Amazon is not the enemy to IBM. Microsoft is a partner uh, for what they're doing. Uh, and even Google uh, is somebody that they can work with. So, you know, I, I always say back in the 10 years I've been working for you, Dave, I, I think the first time I heard the word coopetition, I thought it was like an IBM trademark name because they were the ones that really, you know, led that as to have a broad portfolio and work with everybody in the ecosystem system, even though you don't necessarily agree or partner on every piece of what you're doing. So in a multi-cloud, AI, uh, you know, open ecosystem, IBM's got a real shot. Yeah, I mean, a, a Satya Nadella-like move would be awesome. Of course, Satya had a much, much larger, you know, cash hoard uh, to play with. But, but I guess the similarities, Stu, are, 
you, you're notwithstanding that, that now we have uh, 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 three prominent companies uh, run by uh, Indian native born leaders, which is pretty astounding when you think about it. Uh, but notwithstanding that, there are some similarities just in terms of culture and emphasis and getting back to sort of the, the technical roots, the technical visionaries. Um, so I'm encouraged, but I'm watching very closely, Stu, as I'm sure you are, kind of where those investments go, uh, how, how it plays in the marketplace. But, but I think you're right. I think people underestimate IBM, and, and, uh, but the combination of IBM Red Hat could be very dangerous. Yeah, Dave, uh, how, how many times did we write the article, you know, has the sleeping giant of IBM been awoken? So I think it's a different era now, uh, and absolutely there's, IBM has the right cards uh, to be able to play at some of these new tables, um, and it, it's a different IBM for a different era. Somebody said to me the other day that, and this is probably, you probably heard this, you have too, but it was first I heard of it, is that within five years, IBM had better be a division of Red Hat <laughs> versus the other way around. So, all right, Stu, thanks for, for uh, helping to set up uh, the IBM Think 2020 digital event experience. Uh, we're coming at you wall-to-wall -wall coverage. I think we've got uh, over 40 interviews lined up, Stu. You, you uh, have been doing a great job uh, both last, a week with the uh, Red Hat Summit and helping out with IBM Think, yeah, so thanks yeah, for that. Yeah, Dave, no, no rainy week at uh, the new Moscone like we had last year. Uh, really good content uh, from the, the comfort of our remote settings. Yeah, so keep it right there, everybody. This is Dave Vellante for Stu Miniman. Go to siliconangle.com. You'll check out all the news. Uh, Thecube.net the will have all of our videos. We'll be running wall to wall. Wikibon.com has some, uh, some of the research action. This is Dave Vellante for Stu Miniman. We'll be right back right after this short break.